Oh, welcome back to Hollow Victories, where justice dawns on bad movies. I am your host, Matt Prisons, and I am here with my super co-host. Hello, my name is 3D Squelton. I, I forgot to come up with a name, so I was like, oh, it's live action, so. All right. Why not? Yeah, and, and welcome to our beautiful nighttime episode. Woo! I was Hollow Victory is midnight. I wasn't going to insist on, on doing this, uh, on doing live action Hollow Victories every two mini games, but I'm like, eh, it's like our third anniversary special. It's fun to and do it every once in a while. We're going to be in person anyway. Yeah, so it's, it's our third anniversary, and uh, our first episode, you know, was the fourth installment of the Batman franchise, and our one year anniversary, we did the fourth installment of the Superman franchise. So I think it was time we go back to the less hated but still generally considered bad third installments of those series, both of which are just weird, <laughs> frankly. I, this, I think these are the weirdest Batman and Superman movies. It's Superman 3 versus Batman Forever. Um, yeah. We do have, um, I don't know how much you're going to be hearing them, especially with how far away they are from the mic. We do have Stort and Mitzi in the peanut gallery again. You can see Stuart right here. Yeah, there's yeah, Stuart. I'm, the frog to represent I'm, just, this time. I'm just sitting down enjoying myself. I like how the hats, Michael, thank you. Yeah, you're good. You got Stuart. No, this is actually what Stuart looks like. It's just been this creepy, very creepy thing going on for a long time where the doll talks. I feel ridiculous for forgetting the frog. Um, uh, do we want to bring anything to represent Mitzi, or are we overthinking this now? Nah. <laughs> I can also, I can also show off this Batman Superman collection box set. I bitched a little about it last time, but like, it's this like cool steel case, and you're like, oh okay, and you pop it open, and it's like, oh, it's just a lunchbox for like a regular <laughs> Blu-ray box set. <laughs> that also, I like that though. It includes Superman Returns, which is only sort of nebulously part of the the Superman franchise. But it does not include Supergirl, which was very much a part of the Superman franchise. <laughs> so That's cool, though. I, I, I think they messed up. I think it should have been Supergirl, not Superman Returns. Uh. Anyways, you want to get into this first movie? Superman 3? Yeah, go for from it. 1983? It is a weird one. Yeah, okay. So this is uh, a comedy film starring Richard Pryor, uh, where he, he Richard Pryor is this, like, down on his luck, unemployed guy, but he he learns like, oh, you know, a good good way to make quick money, learn computer programming, and it turns out he's really good at computer programming. So he gets this uh, job with this big tech company, and he once he's there, he finds out that like everyone's paychecks, there's usually a little like half cent on there, a little fraction of a cent left over that just kind of gets rounded off and. Who knows where it goes? So he sets up a, a thing in the system where all of those little shaved synths go into one account and get sent to him. Uh, so he, he gets them extra rounded off synths. Of course, he gets caught doing this. And uh, luckily, his boss is not that mad about it because his boss is very impressed with his uh, computer hacking skills and hires him to be this, like, master hacker in the boss's plan to just, like, dominate the industry. There's only one thing standing in their way. It's Superman, mm -hmm. um, who feels very underutilized in this movie. There's also a subplot about, like, Clark Kent going home to his, like, high school reunion, and he, he meets, like, his childhood crush. It's, it's a whole thing, but none of that is as interesting as the Richard Pryor shit, and none of that gets as much attention as the Richard Pryor shit. This is a Richard Pryor comedy that just has Superman in it. It's weird. It's weird. I, and, and, I mean, it goes some, like, wild places. <laughs> like, halfway through the film, they, they try to poison Superman with, like, a, a kryptonite elixir, and it doesn't kill him, but it does just make him kind of a dick. So he's just kind <laughs> of a dick for a while. Um, he's not like that he, evil. No, he's not, like, he's not doing evil things, but he does, like, he straightens, <laughs> he straightens the, the leaning tower of Pisa. 
And then he's like <laughs> at a bar and he's like flicking the peanuts into the bottles and shattering them. <laughs> it's like, none of this is like evil, but he's just kind of a dick. Um, you said it was poison. Was it like kryptonite or just actual poison? It, I, it was like synthetic kryptonite, I think was the thing. It was okay. like they, they tried to synthesize kryptonite. I know in some, some of the common co- comics that like different type of crypt- kryptonite have like different effects on him. So yeah. I'm not sure if like this is like made of, it might have been like red kryptonite maybe. Yeah. Like no, kryptonite. I, th- I think in the movie they say it's like synthetic kryptonite. They're trying to make their own kryptonite. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. That. <laughs> it's beautiful. Okay. It's like it's fun. Welcome yeah. aboard, Mitzi. <laughs> um. This this plot line results in Superman going to like a, a junkyard and splitting in two and having to fight his evil self, and then that's just over. That's just like it feels like a couple episodes of a TV show because that starts late in the movie and ends like before the climax of the movie. Well, yeah, no, that's ki- that kind of like starts us into the third act of the movie is Superman becoming Superman again. Which is kind of what they do in the second one. He like gives up his powers to be with Lois, but then Someone he's I like seen yet. Then he's then he's like, "Oh, I need these powers to like defeat Zod." So he gets his powers back right before the the third act. I like Superman too. I think it's the best Superman movie. Um Part of the problem with, it, like, the first two Superman movies, I love them to death, but they have this, like, weird, goofy camp to them where, like, random things just happen sometimes. There's a part in, in Superman 2 where he, like, pulls the S off of his chest and, like, throws it at a bad guy and he becomes this, like, giant cellophane thing that, like, wraps them up. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, that's weird. There's a lot of weird stuff in those first two Superman movies, but this is just like, oh, okay, let's take those like few weird moments and make that the entire movie. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, no, like, I just, I just think it's a very weird movie because it doesn't feel very cinematic at all because it feels like it's a bunch of random shit kind of clumped together. Like I said, it feels more like watching several episodes of a TV show. Like, this is the arc for this, like, these, like, first five episodes of, like, a Superman TV show, you know? Um, Because all the stuff with Richard Pryor... Richard Pryor is absolutely the most entertaining part about this movie. I I liked him a decent bit in this. Um, But he's not really a villain that screams film villain, unless they wanted to, like, take him into, like, in crazy places. But, no, at the end of the day, he doesn't even really want to be involved in this shit. And the guy, like, his boss is, like, especially not good for a main villain because he's not even interested in... (laughs) Um, and then the whole, everything going on with Superman, like his high school crush, reuniting with his high school crush, feels like an episode of a TV show. The, uh, him becoming kind of mean and people in, ruining his reputation kind of feels like an episode of a TV show, because they don't take anything far enough for it to be a movie. It feels, everything feels so underplayed in this. Yeah, no, it, it, first off, it feels like they had way too many ideas. They needed to scale it back. Oh, look at that. The, the air conditioner turned off. Finally That's turned nice. off, yeah. Hooray. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Well, we can hear you now. Hello. <laughs> um, wow. I mean, you. Hello. Um, it's the weird yeah. thing. The weird thing about this. <laughs> the weird thing about this is like they don't have any of superman's like classic villains but they have a bunch of like almost superman villains right like there's where the scene where he has to fight his evil self and that's like almost like bizarro but not quite and then there's there's the rich guy who's trying to stop him and he's kind of like Lex Luthor but not quite and and then there's like this is this is a weird thing where the the main villain's sister like falls into like all this computer technology and becomes like a robot briefly and it's like almost brainiac but then he defeats her like immediately it's not nice. even a problem Man, it's just fucking nonsense, honestly. Even, even the love interest feels just a little off. It's not Lois Lane. Margot Kidder 
her, the, Lois Lane gets like a vacation to Columbia or something at the beginning of the movie. No, Columbia is where the, the at the that, start of the movie. I did not realize that was them writing her off. I was like, oh, that's going to be like relevant later. No, <laughs> no, that was that was them writing Marco Kidder out of what the, the movie. Fuck is that? Because on one hand, you're making it like if anyone's invested in their relationship for the first two movies, you're taking that away for this one, from this one. But on top of that. If people do get invested in this one now, like, it feels very temporary. So if you're invested in the relationship from this movie, you're probably aware it's not going to last. Because yeah, they're going to go back to Lois Lane eventually. It's it, just Instead of his love interest being Lois Lane, it's Lana Lang. Right. Like, what? It's so it's weird. Like, it's like... So fucking weird. This is, this is like... A movie that was pitched by like a delirious studio exec who only kind of remembers Superman, right? And he's like, "Yeah, no, nah, he fights like evil Superman, and he's in love with that girl, his childhood sweetheart, Lana Lang." <laughs> well, if it was just like the director miss like forgetting <laughs> Lois Lane's name the whole time, and they just went with it. <laughs> Yeah, and then they had to, like, film the scenes with, like, Margot Kidder showed up, and it's like, hey, uh, aren't I supposed to be in this? And they're like, oh, shit, uh, Lois Lane goes on vacation. Oh, great. Awesome. <laughs> no, like, I, it's it's just, yeah, it's a very bizarre movie. I think Richard Pryor is absolutely the most, like, endearing part of this movie, and I think that it's, like, kind of in spite of this movie, because it's, like, I think it works against it being a Superman movie that he has so much focus. Like, it kind of feels like he belongs somewhere else. But he is the best part of it. He is very fun to watch. His performance is very good. He pulls off this guy who is, like, you know, in his own right a genius because of how much like good he is at this computer stuff. But, like, socially, he, like, doesn't know how to communicate with people at all. And he's bad at standard jobs. He can't do McDonald's. He said they, they said he got fired after 28 minutes, right? Like, yeah. he is, like, he's comes off as like the most incompetent person ever but then when you put him in the right position he's really good at it but his communication skills are skills are still really bad i kind of actually really like parts of the movie where he's like something goes wrong and he just keeps repeating it's not my fault it's not my fault even like as like no one's listening to him no one like no one cares about that they just want to move on and he's like so like fixated on like making sure that everybody in the room knows it's not his fault i love that though it's a good character he's he's very fun to watch but he just doesn't feel like he belongs in a Superman movie unless he's going to become like the main villain or become like an associate of Superman's or something like that. I love the scene where he's like trying to get into this one like supercomputer. <laughs> and so he gets the guy drunk and he's wearing this giant like foam cowboy hat, which like, first off, where did that come from? I love his fucking cowboy hat. Right, but right. then like, then like the other guy passes out and he's like, ha, you thought I was drunk too but i'm not and then he's like like richard Pryor plays drunk really well probably because he has a lot of experience <laughs> but uh you, you know what else i found funny about his character though because i mentioned how like bad his social skills are in this movie but then he goes out and plays that general character like perfectly <laughs> Fucking yeah, no, that's, perfectly. That, 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 that feels like something from a Richard Pryor come. Like that comedy <laughs> films would just do that where they're like, oh, we're going to give like the, the comedy actor a chance to like play a weird character and riff on it. Right. That's that's what uh, Jim Varney does in the Ernest movies. Right. He would do something like that. <laughs> it's like, what is this? Oh. Why is this here? Why oh is this movie God. like this? <laughs> And like I said, I think it actually like hurts it being a good Superman movie because it takes so much of the focus away from him. It takes so much of it away from him. And even when it does cut back to Superman, I feel for me personally, I don't feel like everybody in the audience is like this because I'm sure some of them really want to see a Superman movie. But for me personally, I was fucking thankful when they cut away from Clark because I didn't give a shit about anything with him. I was so bored with him. Clark's story is boring. I'm kind of into Superman, but Clark, nah. I, I don't care about him in this movie. I don't see what the girl fucking sees in Clark. He's so boring. I understand he's supposed to be like the, like it's kind of like the idea of like oh this nerdy character, but like nerdy oh, but doesn't. He's a nice guy and he's such a good father to the kid. Yeah, and... well, if you're gonna do that, you kind of got to go with like oh he's a nerd, but he's interesting. You know, you can't go with like he's a nerd, but he's nice. That's not like nice is kind of like the bare minimum. You know, you can't just be. 
Clark is such a dull person. And he's not always a dull person, because I saw that first movie, and he wasn't dull in that first movie. He's awkward, you know? There's a big difference there between, goes. yeah. There's a big... Oh, no. There's a big difference between dull and awkward. The first movie, I felt like he was awkward. This third one, I thought he was so fucking boring. I don't understand why anyone would want to spend time with this guy. I, I don't understand anything <laughs> about this movie. It's so weird. It's so, it doesn't feel like a movie to me. It just, it, it doesn't, it felt like the stakes were not raised at all for this. I'm sorry to anyone who likes like, this movie because it's not terror. It's not like, Oh, it's god awful! It's it's like the worst thing, like worst superhero movie we've ever talked about. But it's just, I, I, I it is kind of fascinating to me. It is kind of like fascinating that they came to this conclusion trying to make the third fucking Superman movie. I, it felt like they lowered the stakes in every way from the first one. Well, here's my guess with this because the first first movie was a Richard Donner movie. Richard Donner wrote, I think, and directed the first movie. And he was attached to the second movie, but he got in conflict with the, the studio, and so he was removed from the second movie, and they brought this other guy. I, I want to say Mark Lester, but that's not right. Mark Lester's the guy who made Class of 1984. Mm. Richard Lester. Richard Lester directed... He came, he came in and like finished up what Richard Donner had started with Superman 2. And then he's, like, the main guy on this new film, and it's like, okay, he doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> like, Richard Donner is why those first two worked. Mm -hmm. I think it would have been fine as a Superman TV show, honestly. I think it would, it would have been fine. You have some episodes that focus more on side characters than I mean, Clark. That's okay. I feel like it would have <laughs> been kind of a shit TV show, but... It would have made more sense. I would have been able to accept those as TV show episodes way more yeah, than is, a movie. It is, it is weirdly episodic. It is. It, feels, so, it, it so is. Like every, every scene feels so disconnected from anything else going on. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> is there anything? Like, I know you probably want to talk about casting at some point. Is there anything we want to talk about for that? I, I'm not like I don't get to be a computer whiz this episode and look up all the cast members, so I'm kind of relying on you for that this time. Yeah, no, I got shit. <laughs> Although, not, I mean, I think we're both normally doing. It. I should like I, we're normally both looking up the cast when we talk about these. Yes. How's Peanut Gallery doing? Didn't they get like Richard? Yeah, Nick Didn't they get like Richard Nixon to to voice the, one of the computers in the movie? In Superman three. Yeah. Um. Thanks. Like, are you saying, like, they got him to voice or used, like, a sound bite of him? No, like, to, to voice something. Wasn't he in it? I don't think so. Um, I would mean, maybe look up, like, Richard Nixon and Superman. Maybe there's, like, some sort of fun fact involved with that. I don't know. Could be. I think, um, whenever Stuart and Mitzi speak, it's going to be, like, using the camera audio, by the way, because I don't think this mic is picking them like, up. Like, but do, the camera should be picking them up. You, you did mention the one guy with the hacking stuff. I do know that he... He used something to get to a different presidential debate, and they called it Watergate. Hmm. I don't remember. I'll be honest, this is the first time I've watched the Hall of Victories movie completely stoned off my ass, and what a, like, perfect one to watch stoned. Michael is stoned, by the way. I was I, high, so... Michael has been stoned. We have thrown rocks at him. Ah! He's literally bloody. He's bleeding. I fuck! I, they didn't know I was doing a, a fucking Watergate <laughs> joke. I, I think, uh... Were you doing a Watergate joke? Yeah. Okay, I, I thought you. I said Richard Nixon. You get so straight faced. <laughs> you get so fucking straight faced of me, and I believe I'm so. You, sir, do you want to know how fucking naive I am? <laughs> it's really easy to trick me. It's really easy to gaslight me. I've done that for years, Not actually Stuart. I rip off my face. Pterodactyl. You're actually Bill Nye, the science guy, man. I'm sorry. Let's let's get back on track. Sorry. Yeah, I forgot what I was about to say. Casting. Uh, let, yeah, let's, let's talk about this cast. I mean, a, a lot of it is people who were in Superman 4, which we already talked about. The not-quite-Lex Luthor guy is Robert Vaughn, who we have seen before in Battle Beyond the Stars. Oh. He was like the, the cowboy guy. No, no, not the cowboy guy. The, the lonely guy. Oh, okay, yeah. Same thing. The lonely guy with all the money. 
My mistake. No, I remember what you're talking about. Um, I don't. I, I he did not leave much of an impression on me in this movie. I can't say like too many bad. Th- it wasn't like a oh that was such a bad perform. I don't. Rem- I barely remember him in this. I, w- I will say, pe- people have been in Hollow Victories more than Mark McClure. I think Mark McClure is the only person who has been in three Hollow Victories movies as the same character. Because <laughs> he's, he's the only one from this series that was in Supergirl. Uh, so he's, he's Jimmy Olsen in three different Hollow Victories movies now. Oh, he was in Superman 4, too? Yeah, he was in Superman 4. Fuck. He kind of, they, they were doing a lot with Jimmy Olsen in this, at like the beginning of this movie, and then he just fucking disappears. I guess we have like really, is Superman the series that we focused on the most? Because Batman and, does Catwoman actually connect to the bat, that Batman no, universe? No. So, so yeah, bat, so Batman and Robin and, and Batman Forever would probably be like second place, but of like revisiting a universe. But like, yeah, for Batman, we've, uh, for Superman, well, we we've covered did. three of those movies. We've covered three Looney Tunes movies. That's two space Space Jam one and two yeah, and back. I, I guess back I, I, I I don't count. know how much those count as like I a would count contiguous it. series. I would count it. I think that it's like Looney Tunes interacting with live action. I think that's enough of a. I think that's fair because I think like back in action kind of was supposed to be tied to Space Jam at one point, right? Yeah. So like I think that's a fair comparison. Well, Space Jam a new legacy, just like all in a simulation. Yes. Yeah, but it's still like it's a sequel to Space Jam, so it's still like same. It's not the same bugs, it's just simulation bugs. Yeah, I don't know, it is weird. It's, the same it's, it's almost like a different continuity than Space Jam. I, I'm going to say the Batman, the Superman one is a stronger link. Yes. But the, the no, Looney Tunes ones is fair. to com- It's fair to say they're like the same series. Superman 3, 4, and Supergirl all like emphatically are part of the same franchise. They're Looney Tunes movies that acknowledge, like that kind of acknowledge each other to some extent. Yeah. They acknowledge the live action movies, you know. Yeah. Um, who else we got in this? Mention Richard Pryor did a great job. I, I did. I, I mean, I genuinely loved him in this. And if he wasn't in it, I think this would have been one of the ones where I'm like, this was. I because I, a lot of Hollow Victories movies I have like issues with, or I or I end up really liking them by to my shock. But a lot of the time, it's just like that was fucking boring. And I think without Richard Pryor. That's what this movie would have been. With yeah. Richard Pryor, who takes up a lot of the screen time. No, I, I, I enjoyed myself a decent bit. Not, not a lot. Never want to watch this again. But I had a, I, he, it could he have been so laughs. much worse. He yeah. got laughs. He was fun to watch. I, I like when he's like, like talking about Superman showing up and he tries to like pull the tablecloth off the table and just throws everything on the floor. <laughs> yeah. And then just like moves on, doesn't even mention it. <laughs> <laughs> He was flying around. <laughs> I just like his personality in a lot of scenes. I like that awkwardness of his character. I, 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 they I, just they just let Richard Pryor run loose. It was like Richard Pryor, you're funny. Come be funny. I, I like I said, I already mentioned the scene where he just keeps like it's not. It wasn't my fault. I didn't do it. like. I That's, just like because he's like he's talking to himself. He's so insecure about what happened. He feels so bad about it, but no one really cares. Like it's just that's so funny to me. I love that. Um, they're like they're angry that things went wrong, but they're not even necessarily blaming him for it in that scene. I think there's scenes where they do blame it, blame everything on him, but in that scene they're not. They're just like kind of trying to find a plan, and he's still, still he's still fixated. And it wasn't me. I didn't do anything wrong. That's another thing these two movies have in common: weirdly focused on a comedian that they just kind of let riff. Yeah. <laughs> um. I want to talk about... What about Superman's actor? Christopher Reeves, returning once again. He was in Superman 4. He was bored in this. (laughs) I mean, at least they got him back for all four movies. (laughs) Fair enough. (laughs) Um, Looking at you, fucking Batman. Yeah, no, that was absolutely directed at Batman. <laughs> couldn't like get the, couldn't even couldn't even get the replacement actor back for Batman and Robin. <sighs> I actually um, like George Clooney more than well Val Kilmer. Val Kilmer. Kilmer. Yeah, we'll get to it. Yeah, I want to talk about Laura, like the the rich guy's like hot girlfriend, who like is kind of a good guy too. Well, she's, she's, yeah, she's playing this, like, 
oh, ha, ha, like, dumb bimbo character, and then she's, like, reading philosophy, and then he walks in, and she's like, you need a beverage? Nah, I, I, I'm, I still got some. I'm on beverage free for three for this episode, but I was pretty sober prior to this recording. Go ahead, Matt. Sorry. I'm pretty sober, but my tummy hurts today. Um, she, she, she plays, like, haha, silly, pretty girl, but then she's, like, reading philosophy and, like, quoting all this right, smart stuff. Right, right. I forgot like, about when that. no one's around. That was kind Which of funny. Is, it was delivered I mean, well. it's, it's such an obvious joke. But, yeah, I mean... Like, she switched back and forth really well. Because she had, like, an especially obnoxious voice <laughs> when she was playing dumb, you know? Like, she was really high-pitched with it. So it kind of worked. I think it kind of worked when they, like, when she did the switch. Because it, like, it felt like a genuine, like, quick switch. Pitch wise, close. I wouldn't say it sounds like that, but she gets like a really high pitch voice when she's acting dumb. Who plays the not Lois Lane, the Lois Lane like knockoff? Lana Lang. Lana Lang. Annette O'Toole, who actually has been in some like fairly decent stuff. She looks familiar. What else was she in? Uh, Forty Eight Hours. I haven't seen that. That's not it. Oh, there we go. It. She was in the original It. Okay, that could be it. Tim Curry. Bridge to Terabithia. I did see that too. I. Oh, not not the recent one. It's one from the eighties. Oh, I almost feel like that could be a Hollow Victories movie. Even though I even though I really liked it when I was a kid, I just know that it wasn't well received. So I'm like, I'm curious to revisit Bridge to Terabithia. I really liked that movie when I was a kid. I thought it was great. I like how fucking sad it was. <laughs> That's where I keep going with this. Oh, I love Batman Returns because of how dark it was. Oh, I love Bridget Terry Biffia because it got sad. <laughs> you made me want to cry. I don't know. I get it. Um, there was uh, the, the rich guy. His name is Ross Webster. But, like, fuck if I'm going to remember that. But his his sister Vera is is like there throughout the whole movie, and like I really feel like she doesn't need to be. Oh yeah, I feel like she's just kind of like In, until she becomes a robot for like a minute. <laughs> it felt like there were scenes maybe where like, oh, we need to send someone out with Richard Pryor, and we don't want to send our main guy out, so let's send her out. Like during the general scene, for example, like she's the one who went with him. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I, I can't really think of much purpose for her other than what you're mentioning, like with the ending, yeah. Her purpose was to make Mike in the Krabby Patty. Oh. She didn't want to, so he switched her brain into the robot. Ooh. But then she was already spoiled, so even the robot was not listening. <laughs> and I don't want to. He drinks a soda. <laughs> it drinks oil. <laughs> it's <even> better. <laughs> Anyone else you want to talk about? Um, not really. It's a weird movie. Uh, bit, I do. Well, I remember. I want to talk about the opening to this movie. The fucking. You want to talk about the power plant scene or <laughs> nuclear power? Oh, yeah, wasn't it like a nuclear power plant that was having like a meltdown, and he literally carries the ocean oh, no, instead was, of using his was, freeze breath on the fire. It was a plastic. Facility. They were oh. making plastic, but yeah, they had like this acid. Like, yeah, that, like, yeah. If, if the acid boiled, it was gonna create like a rain cloud that could like wipe out half the country. So Superman freezes a lake and drops it on the fire instead of just <laughs> using frost breath on the fire. Right. It was weird. or the acid. Like, what? What was the point of that? Are they trying to do, like, like a part of me would argue that, like, they're trying to do, like, a Frieza thing from the Incredible. Is that his name, Freezer? Frozone. Frozone. I'm, I'm thinking of. Who am I thinking of? Frieza from Dragon Ball? Fucking probably, and that's weird. <laughs> um, no, Frozone from, like, like or, oh, there's not enough, like, water in the air, so he can't do his ability. But I don't think they're, they're, I don't think they're that smart is the thing. I don't think that's, I, I think that that's just, like... <laughs> And plus, it's a li- it might be a little different with Superman, because I feel like he can just kind of do it regardless. I don't know. Yeah, but, he, just, he just has... Well, I mean, because, like, going back to, to the beginning of the film... You need to at least film, show him trying and it failing first. Yeah. 
going back to the beginning of the movie, he picks up like the the penguin that's on fire and blows the fire out with his frost breath. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the, the opening of this movie is so weird. Oh god, I'm because I'm, I'm, I'm naming Cause, a scene after the opening. Yeah. Yeah. No, that was that was as they're like on their way to. Clark's high school reunion. It's it's so weird that like all of these places, Clark Kent goes, Superman shows up. Um, but the the, the movie opens on this scene of Richard Pryor at the unemployment office, mm-hmm. which is a little uh, weird. And then and then it cuts to this like weird Rube Goldberg shenanigans in like downtown Metropolis. They're like knocking over phone booths and people are falling into manholes and and yeah. you know, there's a blind guy who, who like grabs on to like the the line painter right. and there's a guy in a car full of water that's a little <laughs> that's, that's a little new not, a, not even real i've seen that done before yeah there's a bunch of like wind up uh penguins walking around one of them picks up a bomb so it's just like batman returns yeah I feel like we're going to bring up Batman Returns a few times tonight. <laughs> um, and it's, it's, it's just, it's such a weird comedy slapstick opening. Right. For, for your Superman film. And, like, I, I don't even feel like it sets the tone properly. Because, like, sure, this is a pretty comedic Superman film. But I feel like it's, it doesn't get that sticky ever again. Mostly the comedy is, is Richard like Pryor being funny. Yeah, not like slapstick comedy again. Uh, on top of that, this is like more of like, this is a minor note. It's like, doesn't matter as much as everything else being mentioned. That fucking text effect looked terrible. And the, fa- <laughs> the sad thing about it is the text itself, if it was over the right background, wouldn't look bad. Because they did this cool little scrolling effect with it. But they well, placed yeah, they it over that, like, live the first action. Two. Yeah, you, they played it over live action footage and blurred out the screen whenever it showed up, and it looks really unprofessional and really terrible. Like I, it's in a <laughs> in like an amateur film, I would find that charming. In a fucking Hollywood Superman movie, I find that really uncalled for. <laughs> like it's it looked terrible. Like like it ruined every shot it was in. Uh, and you can barely, they use that for the title of the movie, too. It's not just the, they use it for the actors' names and whatnot, but they use it for the title of the movie. And it's like, what a horrible way to do your title. Yeah. Um, it's just lame. It's just, it's a lame movie. <laughs> I don't hate it. I don't hate it, but it is lame. <laughs> I agree. Um, Probably like a three or four for me. I and and not, that we, not that I always give these ratings, like that's not like something we do on the show, but probably like a three or four for me, honestly. I think I gave it a four, just because it's kind of fun. Yeah, it's not, and it's uh, not like god awful. There's scenes where they're trying to make Superman do cool stuff, and it looks about as good as those first. At least I can't say the second one because I've never seen it, but it looks about as good as the first one, you know. Yeah, I um the the really egregious one I think is when like there's those two guys in Italy standing in front of the leaning tower of Pisa and it's like so clearly blue screened. Oh and oh my like, god, yeah, when he moves his hand and you see like the shit around his arm. And it's like like why even do that? Just go to the leaning tower of Pisa. Right. Just send some second unit guy to the leaning tower of Pisa, get two local actors to do this. Like, like, ah, uh, ha, ha, he's selling the Leaning Tower of Pisa, was... but then Superman straightens it. And then he comes back later, and he's got the straight Tower of Pisa, and Superman makes it lean again. If, ah, ha, ha. If you made that look a little bit more like paper cutouts, just a little bit more, you have a fucking Monty Python cartoon. <laughs> um, so we made that comparison in, in Superman 4, too, with the Statue of Liberty. Did we do? Did we really? <laughs> I yeah, forgot. you remember the Statue of Liberty falling, and it was like just like a picture of the Statue <laughs> of Liberty. <laughs> well, we ready to move on? Yes, let's talk about <laughs> Batman Forever. Hand me yes. a beer and introduce Batman Forever. So, Batman Forever is a <laughs> film made by Joel Schumacher. I think released in 1995, right? Yes, 95. Um, so I'm glad I got that memorized since I don't have my wizard computer skills today. 
I hope I like type in a movie and read in what's on the page. Um, it's a movie. Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll start with talking about the two villains. Um, we have Harvey Dent, who wants revenge on Batman because he considers his condition, what happened to him, to be Batman's fault. That's something that follows a lot of the other movies, honestly. And his main mo- motivation is he wants to kill Batman in this movie. And then we also ha- then we have the Riddler too, played by Jim Carrey, very notably. Um, who just wants all of the world's knowledge, he just wants to suck knowledge out of people. He did, made this device that like, could be appealing to people based on what he's advertising as, but in reality, he's just stealing knowledge from them so he can have, be, like, I guess, the smartest guy in the world or something. He's just a nut job. That's the main appeal of his character in this. Um, and once uh, he sees like, this stunt that Harvey does at a circus, the circus is kind of like what sets off a lot of this movie. Because it's what has Riddler, before he even really is the Riddler, it gives him like, oh, like he sees what he does and he wants to work with him because of what he saw at that event. But it also creates <laughs> an orphan with Robin, this 35-year-old orphan. <laughs> the actor is 25. Yeah, okay. I want to be fair to Chris O'Donnell. The added... actor is 25. They do keep calling him like, oh, look at this boy. And I'm like... 25 isn't a boy. He, he looks like he's in his mid-20s. I say 35 because it's funnier. <laughs> it is question, funny. Is he supposed to be, like, 17? Because, like, so many movies don't know how to cast teenagers. In Gre- even, even popular ones like Grease, that's like, they're all yeah. adults. It's like, is, is he supposed to be, are we supposed to think he's a teenager? I think the only hint, or whatever they gave us, was when uh, Robin first put on the suit. Said like, hey, can I be your uh, like, like, Bat Boy, Nightwing, and then Bat uh, Bruce said like, how about like a, a college student? Uh, mm. so, okay. So probably like in his like college years. Like yeah, somewhere between eighteen and twenty one. Yeah. yeah. So, he looks older than that. He does. Yeah, I think he looks thirty. Might I don't know thirty. I think is fair. He lo- I think he looks a little older than me and you, Matt, and we're almost thirty. Um, I don't know. I it might be about our age. It might be. In, it might. It might not be in charitable. I don't think we're being mean to him. I think we're just. Sure I think. I think we're being too nice. I think. I think you're being years. too nice to yourself. You May- think we look younger than him? I don't know. Did he deserve the hate? No. No. Don't bully. Don't bully him over a character. Well, don't. Well, don't. And also, don't bully him over me thinking he looks thirty-five. But anyway, because <laughs> thirty-five isn't a bad he age. He could pass for thirty-five. He absolutely could. Um, but anyway, I also, like, am exaggerating for humor, but anyway, um, but yeah, like, the, and, you know, that's, there's not much else to say about the story, it's an origin story about Batman and Robin becoming a duo, because the Batman films, like, this specific series of Batman films hasn't introduced Robin yet, and you kind of even question with how dark those first two movies are, if they want to bring Robin into it, and yeah. I think the answer in this circumstance is no. You don't want to bring Robin into it because then you get Batman and Robin. But, and I, I kind of stand, I don't really like Robin. I, I will admit in this movie he's not even half as bad as he is in Batman and Robin. I was, I was giving that character shit because I remembered him from Batman and Robin. And really when I made it to the end of it, I was just like, it's, it's inoffensive. He's completely, he does, I don't like him in this movie, but he, he's completely inoffensive. Um, Batman and Robin, I, I kind of love him in Batman and Robin because of how much I hate him, though. It's like a love-hate. I think it's funny how much he sucks in Batman. It's kind of like Bones with the fucking Donkey Kong Jr. show that Sort reviewed, where it's just like, the character's such a fuck-up that it's funny to me. Um, but like... Yeah. But on top of that... Um, Sometimes you just love to hate characters. The villains in this movie are pretty fun. Like, they, you know, like, I guess I, I, I basically said summed up my point. It's like, um, it's Batman meeting Robin for the first time. You have a love interest with this uh, reporter character, this journalist character. Not even a journalist. She's more of like uh, studying people, studying like... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, Criminal psychologist. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and then, yeah, and then you have like the two villains trying to take Batman down for different reasons. And Harvey Dent wants vengeance, which is ironic because Robin wants vengeance on him for what he did, even though he's acting out of vengeance, too, for what, like, he kind of blames on Batman. Um, and it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of fun, though, as a whole. Matt, what did you think of Batman Forever? It took me forever to get to this part. I don't even think she's a love interest. Because, like, she's a fuck buddy. She's, like, she's so horny for him. 
This is he understands sex as well as Spidey Norman does. This is this is a weird thing that Batman and Robin kind of does right because every Batman movie to that point he has had a different love interest. He has a love interest in the first one, and he has Catwoman in the second one, and he's got uh, Nicole Kidman in this one. It's like this man can't just can't hold a woman. He just can't keep her. I know. Okay, but like. Bruce Wayne, he seems uninterested in her when he's Batman, but then when he's Bruce Wayne, he seems kind of interested in her. And that's, this movie plays around with, like, the duality of, like, Batman and Bruce Wayne in a movie with Two-Face, and they don't connect the two at all. It's like those two dots are right there, and you just didn't connect them. You know what? I, I, I'm with, I didn't think about it that way, but you're absolutely <laughs> fucking right. I honestly, like, the, the movie starts with, like, two faces, like, the established bad guy going around doing stuff. Riddler completely takes over by the end. But I kind of like, still like Two-Face. Like, I think they're both fun. Riddler does. He, yeah, Jim Carrey is the most memorable part of this movie. And, and it feels like it's, it's, like, his plan. He's the one doing all the evil stuff. There are even shots that are set up where it's, like, 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 Riddler is in this, like, weird throne, and Two-Face is just, like, standing there. He seems like, oh, the right-hand man, the henchman, you know, Riddler's the mastermind. Well, well even in the climax of the film, you have Two-Face is the one who has, like, the final showdown with them before he dies. But even then, like, in the background, you have all these cutouts of, like, the Riddler logo of the question mark, you know? Like, so it kind of does feel like Riddler is just, like, the showman, you know? Yeah. Like, uh, Two-Face is, the bra- is like, kind of ironically the brain, since, like, Riddler is the one, like, trying to take everybody's information. Like, Riddler's supposed to be the smart one, but it almost feels like he kind of is just, like, the showman of the whole operation. Um, casting in this movie is so weird, because I think some of the casting choices are genius, <laughs> and I think others, I just, I, like, Val Kilmar, I, I think, was worse than George Clooney, if I'm being honest. I, I was so bored with him this entire movie. I don't know, he, he kind of... And I don't dislike Val Kilmar, but... Yeah, he, he looks enough like Michael Keaton, but I... I don't know, they don't give him enough to... Honestly, I, I, I feel like I say they don't give him enough to do... I was just watching Batman Returns before this. Batman barely does anything in that movie. He's barely in the film. Mm-hmm. But it works! And you know, like, uh, we made a great... Uh, you know, me and we were, we were talking about it. Me and Mitzi were talking about it a lot. What fit like kind of like while we're watching like the whole Batman's the straight man against the villains being the comic relief. Ooh, excuse me. And I think that works pretty well. Um, I just don't think I think there's too many scenes with like, I, and I like that idea because I think Val Kilmar does fine in those scenes where he's interacting with the villain. But scenes where we have to focus on him and his personal life or his like. I guess, yeah, quote-unquote, live interest, or Robin, I'm just, I don't care. It's honestly, they gave him too much to do in this film, and he's not interesting in any of it. Yeah. Right? Like, there's a, a mystery and an intrigue to Batman in those first two movies. This, I think, almost reveals too much. hmm Yeah. And I think that, like, so I don't really like him. I'm not into... Robin, it's like he he's not as bad as he is in Batman and Robin, like I said. But I'm not too into him here. Uh, even Nicole Kidman, I go, you know, we'll talk about... I'll talk about that during casting. I'm not... I'm not a... I'm waiting to find a Nicole Kidman performance that I really like, because I'm just, like, kind of realizing I don't oh, I think... Like Nicole Kidman. Nate, can you name something for me she's in that might, like, maybe like, go, like, oh, yeah? The Northman. I haven't seen it. She's really good in The Northman. Okay, because I'm, like, thinking of, like, the movies I've seen her in, and I'm not, like... I don't think I'm a fan, but... I'm also, like, open to the idea that I've watched her worst stuff, you know? Because that, that can't I, happen. This, certainly. Because I don't like her in that I, I Love Lucy movie, either. Like, I just, <laughs> I don't, I don't, I'm waiting to see something with Nicole Kidman that I like. Um, was she in Madagascar? The Northman. She was not. <laughs> um, Maybe Eyes Wide Shut. I don't know. That's, that's a weird one. <laughs> I haven't seen that. <laughs> um, but then you have Jim Carrey. And he's perfect for this. And, I, and he almost, like, works for it and works against it at the same time. Yeah. 
yeah, no, he's like one of the most entertaining parts, but it's also like, this is the wrong energy for the Riddler. <laughs> this is not the Riddler. Like, he would have been better as the Joker, honestly. Like, he has that, like, chaotic... He, he loves it. He loves the crime. He loves blowing shit up. He is having the time of his life being a Batman villain. Yeah. That's the Joker. That's not... I don't know the, the Riddler the that well, to be honest. The Riddler's just kind of this guy who's like, ooh, 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 I, I, I'm so smart, I got all these puzzles for you, Batman. Figure out the puzzles, Batman. I think it's kind of funny. Um, <laughs> Mr. Mr. Puzzler. Puzzler. He, he does propose becoming Mr. Puzzler in this. <laughs> I think it's funny that both this and the Batman have a scene with the Riddler where he, he has this, like, no, you were supposed to understand me with with Batman. Granted, in this, it's Bruce Wayne. In that, it's, like, Batman specifically. But it, it's kind of interesting that both of those movies just had, like, a... No, you were supposed to understand me moment with the Riddler. I think the Batman does it better. I think... Who played him in uh, the Batman again? Uh, Paul Dano. Or Dano. I, mm. I called him Paul Dano his whole life, and then, like, he's out <laughs> on the Oscars, and they call him Dano, and I'm like... <laughs> Wait, is it pronounced Dano? That's like Willem Dafoe, but it's actually supposed to be pronounced Willem Dafoe. Hmm. Is it? There was a there was a video. I think it was like Dafoe doesn't Dafoe sound whatever. right. And, and Willem, no, Willem Dafoe actually did say William Dafoe. Wow. I can pull up the, I will pull up the video after this. Yeah, go for it. I know. I, I I believe you. I just like I've never heard that. I do People it. always it's ask me, is it French Jeff Goldblum or Jeff Goldblum? And I always say the same thing. How dare you speak to me? <laughs> um, I Jim Jim Carrey is just like he is the movie, but also why is he the movie? <laughs> why is this the movie? <laughs> You know, it, 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 to me, it just kind of feels like a circumstance where it feels like if you take Jim Carrey out of that role, then you absolutely have to go back and redo the whole movie. <laughs> because if you did this movie the way it is without Jim Carrey in it, it's going to be boring. <laughs> it's not going to work. It's, it's just it, not going to make sense. It, it's, I it, mean, it barely makes sense anyway. And I've been saying, a lot of people, anyone who says it doesn't work as it is, I understand them. I had a good time, personally. I didn't hate this movie at all. Um, I do think, it, I, I'll say this, I think it's a stupid movie, but I did kind of enjoy it start to finish. I, I didn't find myself, what, like, dreading, like, I... I with, like, Superman 3, it, I'll admit most of the movie I was fine with it. By the end of it, like, the last 30 minutes, I really wanted to be fucking over. Like, really badly. I was fucking tired. I was not having a good time. This movie? No. By the time it was over, I was like, when we... The first time I feel like we really checked the time was, like, less than 10 minutes left. And I was like, I'm okay with this. I, 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 I can do another 10 minutes of this. This is fine. Um... um. <laughs> Do you mean the Joker? I guess because the first movie already yeah, happened. Yeah, we are. They already had. Although this is weirdly like kind of a soft reboot of the series, because of course you've got a new Batman in there, but also they they've recast Harvey Dent, who was Billy D. Williams in the first Batman movie. Granted, it was a very minor role. It was sort of setting him up for future movies, and then they decided to go with. Uh, Tommy Lee Jones instead. Um, what? Like he was made to do this so it's like did Michael Keaton say no, or did they say no to Michael Keaton? Uh, that's a good question. He might have asked for too much. I fucking hate that. I, I'm sorry. That like bothers me so much when it's like, especially when it's a big studio. Like I'm. I, I, I like I, I'm actually looking forward to seeing Inside Out too. I am pissed off that Bill Hader is in fear anymore. I like Tony Hale. I think he's a funny guy. I love Arrested Development. I am pissed off that Bill Hader is in fear anymore because I don't think anyone else should play that character. And it's like 
I just, I, I hate when studios do that. I hate it so fucking much because it's like, maybe, maybe the actor is being unreasonable. Maybe the actor is asking too much. I think a lot of actors are fucking overpaid people when there's a lot of people in the industry who deserve it more than you. But at the same time, it's like, fuck, if they make the movie work, give them what they want. You can do it. He's like kneeling down with his like ah kind of look, and I've heard online like people saying like, "Oh, how's this new Riddler going to be in the Batman?" Because we've already had Jim Carrey as it, and he goes ah, and I wasn't, I had no idea he changed into different outfits and was like going all yeah, that's holistic. That's another thing. How much Jim Carrey was so entertaining. It's like Elton John in a theater. Like, <laughs> you will get a performance from him, and it's so entertaining. And then like I thought. Okay, this is over. He he gets in a uh, he gets in like a white and green outfit. <laughs> no, no, he, J- Riddler has so many wild costume changes in this so movie. He changes crazy. costumes in the middle of the climax. He's literally like Batman, su- uh, Batman, Robin doing stuff. He's like, I need to change my clothes real quick. Hold on. <laughs> he takes off his cloak, goes to the bathroom, takes it off, <laughs> puts on a different mask. He's like, I gotta get ready. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I liked the battleship no, scene too. It feels like there, there's a lot of scenes of him like getting really close to, to Tommy Lee Jones. And I famously, Tommy Lee Jones fucking hated Jim Carrey. He <laughs> hated working with Jim Carrey on this movie. And I almost wonder if he wasn't like deliberately getting close to Tommy Lee Jones just to, like, rile him up. You know, um, just because I'm thinking about this more and more now that we're, like, talking about Jim Carrey and, like, his performance as the Riddler. You know, I always said with the Sonic movies that I didn't like Jim Carrey in the first one because I didn't feel like he resembled the character enough. Uh, And I liked him in the second one a lot because I felt like they got him more down. Like, okay, he's more of a maniac now. I'm starting to see what my issue with it is more now. I think the first movie made Jim Carrey hold back where the second one let him be a Riddler again. And him as the Riddler is exactly the energy you need for... It's not the same character. It's it's a very different adaptation of him. But for a live-action Robotnik, that's perfect. That's absolutely perfect. realized there's something else out there and then he wanted to learn in the grand scheme of things it kind of works because it's like oh he wasn't like a nut job until he got stuck on the mushroom planet for that long he wasn't like a complete nut job he's a little bit of a nut job in the first one i just think it was too risky of a move to make when there was no guarantee you're gonna get a sequel especially when you had him fucking sonic looking the way he did in the original (laughs) like it was like it felt like a lot, like, honestly, God, it felt like a lost cause. Uh, but honestly, I wonder if they didn't get Jim Carrey on that, if they would have even bothered with the redesign. Because I feel like like getting pulling in someone like Jim Carrey might might have made them say, like, we might actually have something here. We might want to, like, fix this. Because it's, it's not just because Sonic fans cried about it. It's because everybody fucking cried about it. But anyway, like, yeah, I don't know. Like, I feel like that energy, that Riddler energy and Robotnik from Movie 2 feel very similar to me. I mean, like, <laughs> I do not find Eggman, like Robotnik, or Jim Carrey particularly attractive. But for some reason, when they put him in that role in the first movie, it's like, all right. I mean, Agent yeah. Stone really liked him. Yeah. I yeah. I mean, it's Eggman is a villain who's like goofy, but you still believe he can be dangerous. You still believe he can be a threat, and Jim Carrey really delivers that yeah um more in the second one than the first one anyway hey i'm the sonic guy i can bring it up occasionally we're talking about jim carrey welcome back by the way jim carrey you played up in the grinch major two major roles he's not the king for that but he's in the running now that's two main character roles you know one literally being the titular character so he's he's in the running now he if we we got to do mr popper's penguins versus eternal sunshine the (laughs) the ultimate pair up (laughs) 
<laughs> I I love that movie. I'm just shitting, but anyway, I really love Mr. Popper's Penguins. I have to make that clear. Like, I think it's a real artsy movie. I appreciate it. John Favreau was in this movie. Was he really? He was, just, he was like, an, he's just credited as assistant. <laughs> Maybe one of the henchmen. Yeah, probably. The mask over his head. <laughs> My name is John Favreau, and I'm here to say hello. Um, Tommy Lee Jones, like he he's playing this like high camp, and I don't really expect that from Tommy Lee Jones, uh-huh. but he works. I like like him. he's pulling it off. He's he's doing this wacky character, and it kind of works. Like I, I don't I didn't expect that from Tommy Lee Jones. He did the he he held that opening scene pretty well, and he held that circus scene well. When you pair him with uh, Jim Carrey, I think more focus is gonna go on Jim Carrey. But even like scenes with them playing Battleship together, that was fun. <laughs> I like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, I will say the way he's defeated is kind of stupid. <laughs> yeah. Because he's just like on a beam and he like throws the coin up and then Batman's just like, coins. Mini coins. Pocket coins. This is also something that we, me and Storm. <laughs> Excuse me. Jesus Christ. It's so burpy this episode. It's an anniversary episode. I got to be there. No, me and Stort did a uh, comment on this a couple of times watching movie too. He was such a fucking whiner <laughs> when he lost, when he was losing. He whined so hard. He kept going. He kept going no, no, no. no. Oh. Like, this is literally us every morning. If we don't have <laughs> he, he, he makes some funny noises. In this movie. <laughs> Just plops himself on the, the ground, Riddler. arms crossed. Riddler tries to move him, and he's just like refusing. Like, I remember all three of you were talking during this scene, but like, like this was when Riddler was sitting down, and then all Harvey did was oh, oh, at him. <laughs> so funny. <sighs> oh, entertaining movie. Do we want to get to cast him? Yeah, let's talk about the cast. Um, I mean, Ronald we've already Reagan. talked about Jim Carrey and, and uh, yeah. uh, Tommy Lee Jones and Val Kilmer a little. Not he does have the Val look. He's, he's got like he the does. Kind of not lips. Like I said, I already kind of talked about. I said my piece about Nicole Kidman. I, I want to see a movie where she. I don't think I've seen a fair assessment of her work because I can think of two movies I've seen her in so far, hmm. which is that I Love Lucy movie, which I did not really like that much. And the uh, and then this, which I also did not like her very much. Drew Barrymore is in this film, and I was kind of surprised she hasn't been on Hall of Victories before. She's been on all of our other shows. She's been on Out of the Ring twice. Uh, she was in <laughs> the latest episode of SSES, uh, and uh, she, she was in a Drunk Rankings movie, even. And that's what's throwing me off, because it feels like Freddy's Got Fingered is absolutely a movie that could be on this show, too. <laughs> I mean, we even, kind of, though, I, even though I like that movie, we, I do we, like. We did kind of a half. We 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 there was like a bit of an impromptu hollow victories at the end of that one. Yeah, where we compared it to Pink Flamingos. Yeah, w- I, watch watch the Freddy Got Fingered video. I really I really like probably it. that corner. Yeah. Probably that corner. Maybe this corner. Yes, uh, click on the link in Michael's neighbor. Come to Michael's house, go to his neighbor's yard, and click the link <laughs> in his, in, in just, it'll just be sitting there in the yard. You can click on that. I like Freddy's Got Fingered a lot, and I'm ashamed. I, I'm not ashamed entirely, but it's like, only, only, I could only talk cer- some pe- certain people into like, <laughs> like giving that a chance. Um, I like Freddy Got Fingered, it's funny. Uh, pff, anyone else like what? Uh, Robin's actor. I don't. Chris I'm not gonna so give. Not. I'm not gonna give him shit because I think it mainly comes down to this. Even in Batman and Robin, my issues come down to the script. He, they, they wrote him as a whiny bitch. He's acting like a whiny bitch in that movie. So like. <clears throat> yeah. I agree. Well, right, and that's why I said that I, I'm kind of build my opinion off of what I saw of him. Because we watched Batman and Robin. That was the first episode of the show ever. So I already have that perspective of him. So I kind of was using that when I was bitching about Robin. He's not that bad in this movie. But he's not that good either. Like, no. he's... 
But I'm not going to blame the actor because I don't. I, I think he's working with what he's got, and, it, and it's not a lot. <laughs> I, I I can't. I don't. Sometimes I see a performance where it's like I can't give you a hard time when that's the script you got. <laughs> I, I got to uh, see something else you do first. You know who we got to talk about? Who? Joel Schumacher. First director to ever return on Hollow Victories. Right. I can't believe that. I can't believe we have never had a returning director before. I can't believe we haven't had two Shyamalan movies. One day. Damn, you're right. We got to do a Shyamalan matchup. Someday. Shyamalan could be like the, like the most visited director on have this show. Done the last we have that, done. That's the that's only the one, one we've done. Okay. And there's other ones. That was like that was like the third episode of the show. That was like a really early one. That was that was a fun one too. I feel like that's like when we really kind of got it down. Um, I still I still remember comments we got on that one. Like it was just so early in the show's run. It's an anniversary episode. We should talk about the past a little bit. Sure. Uh, <laughs> what's your? Do you, do you have a fa- do you have a favorite episode of the show? I uh, we. we we could we could wait a second if you want to like finish talk about this and then do a reminiscent thing. All right, yeah, let's save the reminiscing for the end. <laughs> um, Joel Schumacher, first returning director, and you can kind of like Tim Burton is a pretty unhorny director. <laughs> I think Batman Returns is easily his horniest movie. But then Joel Schumacher saw that and is like, no, nah, let's make it even hornier. I'm just imagining Tim Burton, as he wakes up in his bedroom, there's a big like poster that says sex with a question mark. No, <laughs> that's his motto. He pledges to it every day. There was a, there was a Batman-ass shot in this film that made me think, maybe I'm a little gay. <laughs> that's Joel Schumacher for you. <laughs> no. You, you've got to understand, like, how many people the, the two Joel Schumacher Batman sexualities have awoken. <laughs> how many sexualities have been awoken by the, the Joel Schumacher Batman movies? <laughs> I, I I enjoy his directing to some extent because I do actually think both this movie and Batman and Rob. And I know, like, director and director of cinematography can be different. So maybe it's not fair to give Joel Schumacher credit for that. But at the end of the day, he, everything is run by him. So I think a little bit of credit goes to him. I think there's some really nice shots in this movie. I thought there were some really nice shots in Batman and Robin. I think Superman 3 lacks a single shot that I looked at that I was like, oh, that's really cool. Not to say the whole thing shot poorly because I don't like there's not a lot of shots I can point and say that looks like shit. But there's maybe a couple. But like with uh, Batman Forever, there was actually shots I pointed out like, that looks really fucking cool. No, I mean there they, was like a shot where there's like the car going down like this road, and in the foreground of the shot, oh, we're gonna have some dogs barking. In the foreground of the shot, we have like this nice, like creepy dark blue and black road, but all the way in the back, it's like green lights going off, and it looks so cool. It blends together so well, and then it pans up all the way to the Batman logo. That looks great. Yeah, no, this definitely retains a lot of the style from the Burton movies. Mm-hmm. I, I will say, I was watching Batman Returns. All practical sets, but this yeah. was like right around when CG was coming big. CG so there's bad. there's there's like one shot in this movie that's like a CG fly through of Gotham, and it doesn't look good. And I'm and I gotta give props to those people because they made like a lot of assets in an early time for 3D animation. If this was like a three. If this was a CG film where the whole thing was made like that, it could look good. When you blend that into live action, it just it doesn't work. And I mean, so many movies I love do that. Fucking and Prince of Egypt, one of my favorite animated movies of all time, mixes in the CG with the and it, just, it mixes CG with two D animation, and it doesn't look good. You know, it's just it's just not. It wasn't time yet. Yeah, and, and I mean, to be fair, pretty limited. There are still a lot of great practical sets in this. Yeah, oh yeah, I love the sets in this movie. There was a lot of great ones. I thought the circus looked really good. Yeah, I like uh, the opening scene looked good with the just like the open and like threat yeah, with Two Face. Like, yeah, yeah, had a good set. Two Face's lair that we see like one time in the whole movie. Yeah, <laughs> that was good. Um, it's funny you mentioned the circus. I know, like at least from all the Batman content I've seen with like the, the Graysons, it usually just shows like here's their performance, and then uh oh, they fell, and now they're dead. In this one, they actually had them. 
do something for once, try to fight back against the mooks, ultimately, you know, uh, died in the end, but it was still a little like, okay, they, they're doing something with their abilities. And uh, you know what? It was a day where you could get rid of a bomb. Because yeah. <laughs> Robin threw one into, he pushed it out, threw it into the lake. It's not one, but 200 sticks of dynamite. Yeah. <laughs> um. Oh, anything else? Know. Just, just a weird movie in general. Weird like, for different reasons that Superman 3 is weird, yeah, though. Yeah. It's just kind of like, why would you go this direction with this movie? Like, after the first two, why is this the direction you went? Yeah. Uh, I, I, maybe, you know what it might be, honestly? And I, and I feel like I've heard other people say this, so I'm kind of echoing opinions I've heard, but I, I think it's possible. Because what I always heard is that Batman Returns went darker than people wanted it to. And this might have been a response to that, like, feedback, which is why when you're providing feedback to a studio, make sure you're actually being, like, somewhat constructive, because otherwise, if they do listen to you, you might find out that you wish they didn't listen to you, because maybe you don't know what the fuck you're talking about either. Uh, but, I mean, maybe some people are happy with Batman Forever versus uh, Batman Returns, but it's like... You know, like, it went from being, like, this really dark and depressing story to something really silly. Like, Penguin and Riddler could not be more different in terms of a Batman villain in these movies. Like, they they are, like, polar opposites. That's that's another comedic actor. And I think that's the most I've ever seen Danny DeVito act in a movie, is playing Mm. the Penguin. Do you think it's good? Because I loved that when I was younger, but I might have also just been like, I like it because it's dark and creepy. And it's really easy to impress me at that age. Here's the thing. I wasn't that into it when I was younger, but I, I was just re-watching it, and I'm like, nah, this, this is kind of good, actually. I, I kind of like Batman Returns. They made me feel so sad for his character, even though he was blatantly doing horrible things to people. And that, that always stuck with me. That's why I like Green Mile so much when I was younger, is because you literally have these, like, terrible people who are being executed for, like, some horrific crime they committed. But I just felt attached to them because it's just like, shit, their story's so, like, sad and fucked up. So, like, I, 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 like, I like it when a movie can make me sympathize with someone who isn't necessarily a good person. I think it's a, I think it's a hard thing to do, because most of the time when people try that, they fall flat on their face. So when you're actually able to do it, like, effectively, I think it's amazing. And I was a kid, so I could be completely wrong, but that's what the fucking Penguin did for me. I felt fucking bad for him, despite yeah. the shit he was doing. Yeah. No, I, I feel you. He's, he's a sympathetic character. Um, in in those um, just like in general like it's the whole Batman series he's cool he's cool I gotta see the animated series still but I probably will because it's being that that Batman animated the animated series movie keeps getting recommended to me from that one video I just did so so I probably will check out that show finally um, you should also check out the People's Joker I will. Which pretty prominently mm. references Batman Forever. <laughs> um, but the, the penguin in that, it's just like, I, he's my favorite character. <laughs> I love the penguin in that movie. Yeah, he's very sympathetic in that too. Like, well, I mean, in that he's just like he's just the main like character's best, best friend. Yeah, he's just the bestie. <laughs> um, he's just a cool guy. Anyway, I, we've come to the portion of the evening where we need to vote on which one of these movies is better. And I think we've made it pretty clear where we stand. <laughs> yeah, Superman 3 is taking the gold tonight. Do you want to even do the vote? Do you want to just both, both say it's like Batman Forever? It's Batman Forever. What, what did the audience say? The, bat, the, the audience also said Batman Forever. What was, 73 to 27. I don't blame is, them. Like, I mean, it, it, one's entertaining and one is like, one is entertaining throughout and one has an entertaining person in it. Yeah, I don't know, the, the thing is, like, Batman Forever has its defenders. There are people who will who will maintain, like, no, Batman Forever is a good movie. And I think that's Superman fair. 3, I don't think it has quite so many defenders. I think people who like Superman 3 tend to be like, ah, it's, it's kind of funny. I think that, like, my main stance on Batman Forever is I think it's stupid, but I think it's entertaining. 
Stupid doesn't mean bad, though. And I, I, I like, it's like I called, like, I, oh my god, I got a fucking angry comment because I said Sonic Shuffle had a weird story uh, on a video recently. Shuffle, okay, like, actually, I think Sonic Shuffle actually does fucking suck, by the way. So I'll just say that. I'll double down on that. But no, like, weird does not mean bad. And I even think to an extent, stupid doesn't mean bad. It often does. I get, like, I think calling something weird is a lot less offensive than calling something stupid, but... Oh, I love weird movies. Yeah. Um, I mean, you have a whole... Keep movies weird. You have a whole magazine about it. Um, but stupid can work. I think Hardcore Henry is a little bit of a stupid movie, but it's so fucking fun. It's so fucking fun. It's dumb fun, you know? That's, like, what people... That's how people call it a lot. I think that Batman Forever is stupid, but I enjoyed the entire thing. I would much sooner watch that again than Superman 3. Um, I, I agree. I'm with you. Uh, so, Batman Forever wins. Um, do we want to announce the next movie? Or do we want to let's, reminisce let's a little bit? Let's reminisce a little. What is your favorite episode? <sighs> it's hard to say, honestly. I, I will say, like, two that were back-to-back that I really liked. I really enjoyed the Grinch versus the Cat in the Hat immediately followed by Southland Tales versus... What was it paired against again? Uh, Waterworld. Waterworld, Waterworld. I really liked those two. Uh, I do like all the guest episodes. Um, having Zach on for Eight Crazy Nights finally was a great thing. The Care, I, I, Care Bears versus um, My Little Pony could have fucking sucked because it just felt so out of our element to talk about that. But I think bringing Mitzi on really helped with that one. Um, I love doing the fucking, <laughs> I, I love the Indiana Jones one and Star Wars one with Olivia. I loved the, uh, the Wiz versus, what is that fucking movie I hate called again? The, the Wizard versus Joysticks. I, I can't, Joysticks I fucking hate. And I, but I had, I like doing the episode with Chris. I, it's really hard to pick a favorite episode. I even thought the Felix the Cat versus Tom and Jerry one recently. I really loved that one. Um, that one was fun because we like very clearly disagreed and that's kind of yeah. rare we're usually on the same page right now and i feel like my opinion on this will change i'm gonna give it to southland tales versus Waterworld, just because mm. i felt like that one was such a choice we worked for that one yeah and i, I appreciate it for that but i might i might change my mind tomorrow you know because I, I like so many of the episodes we did um i think that avatar versus Dragon Ball Evolution was the first one where I was like, we really got this down. So that one holds a place in my heart. I like the first two episodes. I don't think I, they're bad. Honestly. But that, to me, that was like the first one where it's like, oh, we we know what we're doing now. I I really like Garfield versus Marmaduke. The problem is I was, like, in the early days of this, I, I wasn't editing as much. I wanted to keep, like, the flow of our conversation consistent. Where, with time, I'm like, no, no, trim this down, trim this down, cut out all the gaps, cut out all the pauses. So, it's it's not, like, the most tightly edited episode, but I did really enjoy uh, Garfield vs. Marmaduke. I do, too. I like all the guest episodes. Um, Tom and Jerry vs. Felix the Cat was a solid one. I, I do like that one a lot. I do like that one a lot. I'm trying to think if there's ever been an episode where I, I just felt underwhelmed by the end of it. Like, I don't like... I think I've enjoyed every episode we've done. Uh, I'm happy to say that. I'm trying to... Uh, like, right now, I'm trying to think of what my least favorite episode is. And it's hard to think of one. I bet I could if I looked at the playlist. I bet I could, like, name the one I like the least. I'm looking at the playlist right now. Let me take a look at that. Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention the one we do with your friend... What's his name? I'm sorry. Oh, uh, Peyton. Peyton. I liked that one a lot, too, because he gave all the insight on Percy Jackson. That was a cool one. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. What's the most throwaway episode of Hall of Victories that we've done? Robocop versus Total Recall? No, because I really liked watching. I really liked watching Total Recall. And that gave, I, I really had fun doing that one because I got to talk about this movie that I really like now versus the bad version of it. Can I see that real quick? What's the most? Um, like you know which one? Okay, I I feel like a little bit of a dick for bringing this one into it because this was a guest episode too. I 
really did not care about Spawn or Steel. <laughs> that was one that I, I, I felt like you and Chris. It was a, it was it was a good funny episode. episode I think you I, and Chris carried it though, because I felt like I was just like, oh, I don't fucking know. I didn't like it. I didn't like either of them. Stuart, your episode's coming. We, we're going to have Stuart on as we talked Stuart about. We, Even like. Like, <laughs> probably should have. That was a, a fun ha- episode, though. That was Haunted Mansion versus the Country Bears. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not That's watching that ever. Stuart, watch this with us. No. Haunted Mansion versus Country Bears were kind of both like throwaway movies, but I kind of enjoyed that at the end I talked you into voting for Country Bears. It's like the first time that ever happened, too. <laughs> Uh, it's not like that's a common thing. I think me and you both normally stick our ground, stick to our ground pretty well. That was like the first one. I was like, "Shit, you make a." I, I kind of agree with what you're saying. I even thought like because I really, I really hated watching Honda Mansion 2023 and Jungle Cruise wasn't like terrible, but I didn't have fun with it either. Yeah. But the episode was great. I loved that one. I, I thought it was a great it's, episode. It's because we just fucking tore into Haunted Mansion. Favorite movie versus and least favorite movie. And that we probably already said this in the past. Uh, but. Favorite Glenn or Glinda. Least favorite uh, Last Airbender. Favorite Book of Henry. Least favorite Last Airbender. That's such a bad movie. I, it's like. Yeah, I, like, it's I think predict- it's easily the worst thing we've watched. Even the fucking Rob Schneider movies were more entertaining. Yeah, than no, Last Airbender. It's like it's one of the few instances where everybody is right with what they say about it. <laughs> Um, it's it sucks. And joysticks is close. Joysticks is fucking See, close. I, but I, I, don't, I don't hate but, joysticks anywhere near as much as you do. But at least I fucking hated it so much. But I, and I mean, like, I think that it's like we're at a point now where it's like it, it could even be the mood I was in when I was watching it. You know, like I was not. I did not feel like listening to these fucking like dick jokes and video game jokes all night. Um and that and it just like oh like it could absolutely be a time and place thing with joysticks but I th- I thought it was such a shitty comedy but at the very least it didn't have the blueprint right in fucking front of them <laughs> at the very uh, least it's kind of a hard movie to make good I think I think probably the animal is second to last for me animals low on my list I I like honestly God I have Care Bears and my little pony like very low but it's because it's not appealing to me like both of them appeal yeah. to an audience especially care bears like it was like yeah a little kid is gonna love that like it, it's a very good animation and care bears like it's yeah. very it's very charm and it's just it's just so not for it, like so not for like 20 whatever how old i was when we watched <laughs> that me like probably and that's and that and that's and that's fine. Like I, I can't. I, I like childish shit. I'm a fucking huge fucking Sonic fan who won't yeah. refuses to shut up about it. No, my my thing is that, like I just <clears throat> any toy media I can get my hands on. I'm just an absolute like, stuck with Barbie movie. Right. Like Lego series, like all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Watch the Trolls movies. Yes, the Trolls movies. Yes. Oh yeah, you got me to watch Trolls too, and I actually enjoyed it. Um, I haven't seen the first or third one, but I, I like Trolls too. It was I fun. recently found out there's a. Um, did you, you showed me at the toy store, or not the toy store, at the DVD store a Mega Blocks movie. It's a Mega Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we found I, a like, Mega Blocks movie. <laughs> um, Where's the Lincoln Logs movie? God damn it. Wasn't there one about, like, bobbleheads? Yeah. I, oh, God. Don't, don't tell Matt about that. Don't remind Matt of that. Bad memories. I don't want to watch that. That, they're, they're, <laughs> Matt will I, recommend I have, it. I have a matchup for that one. Don't you worry. Oh, no. Is it the Emoji movie or the Play Mobile movie? Uh, it's the Silly Bands movie. Ooh, <laughs> that uh, could actually be worse. Than, I think both of those could be worse than the Emoji. The Emoji movie is like expressive. They I'm, animate I, face as well. Look, I, I told you, like, sick of shit what you ever saw. I have my limits. That applies to this show, too. There are movies I will not watch. There will never be a disaster movie versus epic movie episode, because fuck those movies. I'm I don't want to watch them. I, never I don't s- want to watch the Emoji movie. The Emoji movie is like... I would say if we watch that, it's not going to be at the bottom of my list. But it's like, because I did watch that movie... 
I but th- I also, it's more of like distaste for the studio for letting that one happen than it is like hatred for the actual movie. Because it's just kind of a generic kids movie. Yeah, at the end of the day, I, at the I end of the day, it's... I feel Last Airbender is worse. Yeah, like at the end of the day, it does like... Animation-wise, it's Sony Animation. They had competent animators on the project, and they had like the characters emote in a way in scenes where it's like, yeah, that that's a good expression they like animated there. Like uh, they they did like a lot of this is clearly like two D work in like evolved into three D models. They there's some people there who knew what they were doing. Having John Stewart voice the shit emoji, I get the sense of humor there. I get like they found this like eloquent voice actor to be shit. Like it's. It's I, I get the joke. I don't think I can't say it's funny because no, I don't think it's that funny. But I mean, at the very least, there's like something. But I, I at the, it just kind of feels like the studio is like testing what they can get away with, and that's what that's what upsets me about the emoji movie. Not not that it's that bad. It's just that they thought it was okay to do that. <laughs> Let's make a movie about fucking emojis. A movie about. Fucking emojis would be interesting. Like, like making a movie about adults using them instead of kids, and they're like, Ooh, they're eggplant. like, the eggplant could be the main character. <laughs> Make it a movie about an asexual eggplant emoji. <laughs> this is already better than the emoji. <laughs> like, oh, that, that, that's a billion dollar idea right there. Iconic eggplant emoji. <laughs> uh, well, this was fun. Um, All right. Any any other like reminiscing questions? I think we got like the big ones out of the way. Yeah. No. I I th- I think we got it. I think we're good. Let's let's talk about next episode. Next time on Hollow Victories. This is maybe not an immediately obvious matchup, although it is two disco musicals from 1980. The last year you could get away with making disco <laughs> musicals. Uh, but also. These two films are somewhat notorious for being the impetus for the Golden Raspberry Awards. Mm. So I think on top of talking about these two films, we can also take a little time and talk about the Golden Raspberry Awards. Okay. Because I have opinions. I have shared my opinions a bit before, but I, I, I want to hash it out. Mm-hmm. Um, it's Xanadu versus Can't Stop the Music. I don't think I've heard of either of those. That'll be interesting. Can't Stop the Music, probably I've heard of. The other one, not at all. It's a Village People movie. Okay. Uh, neat, neat. All right, I'm down. Something new. Yeah. Interesting matchup. Uh, and uh, anything else? All I can say is still trying to bring Disco back, Mac. Fuck. Still trying to bring, bring back Disco, Matt. Damn, he brought it back. That would have been cool if I didn't <laughs> fuck up the line. <laughs> That's a community uh, reference. Until next time, I'm Matt Presents. Uh, we'll see you in the next one. Peace.